Hey, okay, so we've got a guest with us. Calvin is here. Calvin's actually doing an internship um, with us and has been present for part of my presentation. And uh, we thought we'd bring him on to uh, address a few questions that he has. Thank you for having me. For sure. Um, this has been awesome to watch. I have a question about the, the depth map. Um, yeah, let's go to that this, example. This one. I want, I'm wondering if it's automatic, if you just have the tool and it tracks it tracks the, the image and separates it from the background in the same way you would use um, the, the select tool on Photoshop. Right, yeah. Okay, well, let's, let's, let's delete everything here and we'll give you an example of what the machine is sort of thinking about in the background. Okay. Oh, this is the depth map. Were you meaning maybe the magic mask? Yeah. Ah, the magic mask. Okay. Let's go over to the magic mask tool and Again, basically, you know, we'll, we'll delete this operation here and we'll do the mask again for you. you we're selecting what we want to have um, masked yeah. out. So we have to give the computer that first piece of direction. Um, and again, with this example, if we go into our magic mask here and we select uh, object right here, magic mask object, and we draw our window around the person will quickly get a selection and if we select better you'll see how it cleans up even a very complicated area um, and, and separates now that that piece of cloth from the blue that is the background yeah, yeah. if we wanted to um, add the light into this um, plane of focus we would simply uh, select the light and now it's been added. So now we've really got the whole subject isolated from the background. Yeah. Um, and this would also allow us to, if we inverted the mat, I could now have control over the background separate. So if for instance, blue wasn't the flavor of the day, we could quickly go into color temperature and we could um, you know, sort that out quite, quite quickly. We're getting a little bit of um, blue coming through here. Mm. What we can do then is use the minus tool, draw a little circle around here, and you can see right away, really it cool. pops that blue area out from the mat. Yeah. And you know, that's quite a complicated operation because this ring is pretty fine, Yeah. right? So um, I'd have to uh, play that out so that it all sticks. Maybe we'll do that here, let's see. And you can see even through the play out, it's remembered to minus uh, the blue through the ring here yeah. and disqualify it from our key. So yeah, there, there's a, a great example on how Magic Mask can just deal with a background yeah. if you invert the map. I also had a question about the depth map and the smoke. Yeah, okay, let's go to the depth mat example here and I'll bring it back up. And the smoke is called fast noise. Fast noise. Is that standard or is it um fast noise comes with resolve. Okay. Yeah, and it's a way to create cloud particles. Yeah. And then if you want fog out of the cloud particle, you just stretch, stretch the cloud until it looks um, more like more like fog. Hmm. I was yeah. wondering if it was um, a VFX thing where you get given an asset. And, and we get assets all the time, and those yeah. assets sometimes come with a pre-built mat from yeah. uh, VFX land, and, and, and then we would use that. But we wouldn't be using the depth mat if we were giving an, given an asset yeah, nice. with an alpha channel uh, already. In this example, we really wanted an alpha channel. We wanted this to be a VFX element, but mm -hmm. we didn't have it. And again, we were trying to make the shot previous to this shot, which had a ton of smoke, match this shot which all of a sudden as you can see has no smoke whatsoever at all that tree is uh, very dark in the background and you know using the depth mat feature and fast noise we are able to put just smoke in uh, the background mm. but again in this example i wanted some smoke over her but not over the horse yeah. he's on a different plane he's cleared the smoke and if we travel forward now in the shot you'll see that she does come completely out of that smoke plane and 
you've got smoke just basically in the, in the background. So that was without the depth mat and uh, the fast noise, and this is with the fast noise and, and depth mat. I'm wondering how it knows, if it's, is it a time thing, so you program the time to know when you want the, the noise to go in and out of yeah. the subject? Right, yeah, so the noise is just a flat, just a flat piece of image. Yeah. The way you control where that noise lives, for instance, you're asking, why is it just in the background? Why isn't it in the foreground? Mm -hmm. Well, this is what the computer's doing basically with the depth mat. Yeah. So if I go into the mat itself, and I display it, I can see here now what's being affected by the smoke. So anything in the black region is going to have 100% of the smoke. Yeah. Anything in the white region, 100% white is not going to have any smoke. And you can see in her neck area here, it's kind of a mid gray. Mm. So that'll get a little bit of the is that smoke. Yes, yeah, so we did control this for this example. We um, controlled through far limit and near limit, mm. where and what was going to be affected by the smoke. And on top of that, we actually added some keyframes in here yeah. to help bring that smoke down as she's traveling uh, through it. Yeah, so there's a few operations here to make the shot look, mm. um, you know, as real as it, as real as I think it does. Yeah. You know, this would have been almost impossible before um, without super complicated uh, VFX work to cut around her, the moving hair, the, the mane of the horse, the soft focus uh, elements that blur the background into the yeah. foreground because of that soft focus. So the um, depth mat is crazy powerful tool. Mm -hmm. You can see how nice of a shape it actually does cut around the horse. Even just a few years ago, doing green screen, like keying green screen stuff well, was a pain. Like with, uh, I used After Effects. Yeah. And just doing that was a pain. You had to go in and rotoscope. Rotoscope everything. Right, yeah. So we're doing less rotoscoping now, which is yeah. good for everybody. We want these tools to work quickly. We want to get results live. We've often got people in the room with us, and they don't want to watch paint dry. They want mm -hmm. really quick results. And now we're, you know, we're being able to do that with these new tools. I you want to be a color What's your goal? Um, you know, I just really enjoy making films and I find that um, I tend to be involved in the entire process. When I'm working with a team of people, I do smaller productions. Mm. So I'm, I'm dealing with the lights and I'm dealing with the camera and I'm dealing with post-production, what the color looks like. Right. And it's, you know, it's a smaller scale, so I'm using Premiere and After Effects and working with all these things. I find the most intriguing part of it is the shaping the light mm -hmm. on set. Mm -hmm. On set, yeah. yes. And of course, we want it to be right on set. Yeah. We don't want ever to be just to fix it in post place because you got to fix it in production. Yeah. And that's where you really get the most volumetric uh, options in 3D space when mm. you're using lights the way that light is falling off of a 3D subject, you're never gonna be able to replicate that in post yeah. because I've got a 2D volume mm. with an option to basically brighten the whole face and not add contrast where there it wasn't any yeah. to begin with, or it would look quite fake. So, you know, you really wanna get it right on set and then where we can enhance, we would do that in yeah. color correction but you know, the best stuff I've seen needs a balance, needs a little bit of focused light here and there, but mm. often it comes together real quick, you know, with sometimes a lot that they've prepared on set or a lot that I've, I've created, it really brings the um, shot to shape. Because when you were doing, uh, I think it was this footage, mm -hmm. you know, they, they give you a, a kind of a, a, a template to where the camera on set, mm -hmm. they're working with a template. Um, I have a question, I don't know if you know this, but I have a question about how the LUT affects the, on the day of shooting, you're given a LUT. How do you apply that to the camera? To like yeah, yeah. So, so LUTs are created, there's many different types of LUTs too. There's um, uh, what we call a viewing LUT. Yeah. And that's generally just to get 
a logarithmic image, so a camera acquired source, source footage. Um, uh, you might apply a viewing LUT onto the, the camera original source footage so that you get a more balanced normal image where yeah. uh, the contrast is sort of built in. That's, that's a viewing LUT and you, you put that on sort of the monitors on set and you may even add that same LUT in the dailies so that people at home, mm. uh, producers are watching more of a balanced image and it's not completely flat like for instance this example yeah this is a raw image no LUT and um, you'd be hard-pressed to cut this sequence together and have somebody watch it without really getting fatigued because yeah. your eye just doesn't know where to go right so a, 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 a LUT can be as, as basic as just something that adds uh, shape to a shot based on um, information input from the um, camera side so that would mm. be ISO uh, that would be your color temperature mm. and that would be um, your codec as well sometimes can can affect how your LUT reacts with with uh, your images then there's um, LUTs we use to in post-production to balance yeah. um, the image that the manufacturers make so as okay. I was saying earlier this particular footage here is Sony XOCN yeah. and the software and the camera manufacturers have been in talks with each other and in this case Sony's preloaded mm. a lot for this particular camera and codec into Resolve and it sees Resolve sees that this is coming from the Sony camera and yeah. it will automatically um, put that LUT um, on to the image. Now I've got it turned off because I often don't work with the manufacturer's LUTs. Yeah. Um, I often will, will build an image uh, from scratch. From that scratch build, I can make a LUT and then apply that to other footage or other days of footage that come in or even mm -hmm. give it to the dailies person to apply to the dailies. Um, I find here we can create more of a refined LUT because of the monitoring we have. Mm. It's evaluation grade. It's in a controlled environment with controlled lighting. Mm. Um, on set, often it's not the best monitor. It's yeah. uncontrolled lighting. Maybe the monitor's cold. A lot can change on set. We, we don't often use the, the LUTs that have been uh, designed on set in uh, post workflow. We'll often see them mm. to see sort of what the intention was because yeah. it gives us a great uh, uh, starting point, yeah. uh, especially with color temperature. Like you really don't know if they want it warm or cold unless you've had that conversation. Mm. But if you see the LUT yeah. um, that they put on that particular footage, you'll know right away mm. um, what the theme was for color temperature. And then that gives you like a jumping off point. For That's that. right. Yeah, exactly. So you'll, you'll find that the LUTs in Resolve are in this category here and uh and why don't you, know, you use Sony these one will be here why don't i use this yeah uh well sometimes i do but usually i just like to feel where the contrast and the light lives normally and where it wants to be bent with the tools i have mm -hmm. rather than just being told well here's how the shot it's wants to be to manipulated yeah. using the manufacturer's recommended one size fits all yeah um sort of approach for me, I really want to like look at the footage, look at its values, um, look at the scopes, see where everything wants to live, and then, you know, bend the image with all of that information. Let's talk about adding noise to the image. Why, like, how is that done in Resolve, in DaVinci Resolve, and why would you do that? What is the effect that that has on, the emotional effect that that, that has on the work? Yeah, okay, great question. I'll give you, I'll show you an example of a really nice noise tool uh, that we have in Resolve. And the reason I say it's, it's, it's nice is because it's actually interacting with the different levels of light in the shot. And that's the way that film reacted as well. So if you um, had an underexposed shot, for instance, um, you'd have more grain uh, in that overall shot but the exposed areas of that same shot would have less grain. So in the past, what we would have are these tools that would just apply a wash of grain over all of the image, irregardless if it was underexposed, exposed neutral or overexposed. Now what we have in Resolve, and I'll just 
So let's quickly do a, uh, just a little balance on this image here. Bring up Resolve's built-in uh, noise tool, which is actually under grain. Uh, and it's just called film grain. And maybe it's called film grain because it's trying to emulate what grain on film used to be like. Yeah. And it, it's really quite neat. So I'll boost it up quite high so that we can see what's happening. I've got it set up to 16 millimeter here. Um, I'll put the opacity all the way up. And if you look closely, what you'll see is that in the highlight areas, uh, there isn't any grain because that's, that's exposed at a very high level mm. and it's exposed well and well exposed film was more grain free than underexposed film. Yeah. Um, you'll see as well, it's being hidden a little bit in the darkest areas because we don't want to see that there. We know that there isn't any information there. And there's no point in putting grain into that area. And of course, our, our mid-tone area, the background uh, in the sky is where most of our grain is present. Mm. And similar to how film reacted um, with, with grain, mm. this tool is, is reacting in the same manner that it's putting the most grain in the most average um, image area. I'll play that out for you here. You know, I think it does something different for everybody. I think that um, some people use grain to create uniformity across something that maybe wasn't so uniform. We see that see that often. And again, reducing the grain, same idea. If you've got shots that are grainy or not grainy, um, we often use noise correction to create, um, you know, you want the experience to be seamless. You don't want to be popping between grain shots and not grain shots because it it's a distraction and it pulls you out of the movie. But I think for a lot of people, it creates a nostalgic feeling for them, especially if they're trying to emulate film. Uh, it takes the edges off of digital video. Uh, the grain naturally will create softer edges, especially when it's on the, on the top or last layer, which is where I put my grain. Um, can create almost a spooky feel um, compared to a super clean mm. image I find and um, I think a lot of people are just drawn to a pattern that's happening on an image that is sort of dancing around almost yeah. so uh, on a subconscious level I'm not totally sure how to describe it but it really does create that uniformity and it really if it's evenly put everywhere it really helps the story sort of flow. You know, it can be overdone, but if it's, if it's done just finely enough, it can mm -hmm. certainly enhance a uh, period piece, you know, yeah. or trying to emulate film, or take that digital video edge off. Yeah, absolutely. I see that a lot, um, especially, I think the more technology advances, the more people kind of want to strip, strip it back. Yeah. And like work with less, um, have, you know, it's cool that you have all this up, uh, all this um, technology. Um, and you have unlimited options, and I feel like the more technology, the more options we get, the more people are gonna drift towards like working with stuff with that's a bit limited because it helps you, I think, like squeeze out a little bit more creativity, mm -hmm. something more interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. When you're working with like a... But you have to always do it with the story in mind. Yeah. So this is comes back to the classic, you know, let's use a crane or a steady cam for the sake of using a steady cam because mm. it's fun to have motion in the shot. Well, motion in a shot should be, um, should have an emotional a attachment to it. So, mm. uh, for instance, you might employ a steady cam shot on um, a scene where there's... Um, you know, somebody's having a, an emotional moment and, mm -hmm. and you want to draw the viewer into that emotional moment. So you do that slow pushing, yeah. you know, but a lot of times you see a slow push in just for the sake of a, yes. a slow push in, yeah. you're not drawing any emotion out of it. So these tools have to be also very carefully used and with the thought that we're using them to help tell the story, mm -hmm. to drive emotion and that there's, that there's a purpose to them. Yeah. And you get a lot more mileage out of them that way too. Yeah. Yeah. Being a cinematographer, having that background, like what are the positives and what are the, what are the drawbacks with that being a colorist? Yeah. Oh yeah, so so having come from a, a, a DP background, 
and and having experienced you know telecine sessions from from film to video and then the way it's gone sort of the di route from digital to uh, digital um, color correction having that dp background uh, has been invaluable i am compassionate about what happens on set and the stresses on set and what can happen uh, with weather on set and um, the effort that goes into putting a production together. Um, when I get footage in here, I make sure that I treat every frame as if I'm struggling like people on set often do to get uh, a day, uh, you know, done. Um, I make sure that I'm uh, carefully looking at um, all the options for a shot that I'm matching everything as carefully as I can because I, I, I you know when you're in this room it's very easy to work quickly um, because you're in a completely controlled environment but you have to appreciate how much effort and time was put into um, uh, you know at the at the set um, and even the, the preset stage of, of production it all comes down to a culmination of sort of what's on my screen. I'm seeing it at the final resolution, probably the best resolution that will ever be, the footage will ever be seen at. And you really have to respect that as a, as a colorist. You have to um, acknowledge that um, a lot of people put a ton of work into this and you've got you've to make sure that all the levels are perfect, you know, throughout everything and that you're, you're really giving it your all um, because uh, otherwise you're just doing a disservice um, to the craft. Yeah, it's a collaboration um, between everyone, but it's easy to get distracted in this room mm -hmm. when you're sort of alone, that it's, it's not so much of a collaboration, um, but you, you, you can't have that mindset. You have to feel like you're, you're one of the team members and that you've, you've been there in the trenches. And, you know, as a DP, I was there in the trenches, so I can sympathize um, with what's, what happens on set. What made you transition from working on set to working in post? Great question, yeah. And I still wonder sometimes <laughs> myself if I've made the right choice. Um, being on set was an amazing rush of an experience. Mm. Like it's, there, there isn't a whole lot that compares to, you know, teeing up a shot, lining it up, having the talent come in, they call action, everything's working, the camera crane is moving, the lights are on. It's just, it's, it's a super crazy rush. Yeah. But it's also um, a lot of hours yeah. um, on set yeah. and away from family. Yeah. And I felt that in sort of my younger days, that was an option for mm -hmm. me before I had um, kids and a, and a family. Um, and then later in life, I felt like I wanted to just start a family and mm. commit a bit more time to my kids. Yeah. And that DP lifestyle wasn't, the way I had mine set up anyways, wasn't really conducive mm. to having uh, the quality of family life uh, that I wanted. Wow. Now that, that might be a bit selfish of me to say because I did have the post fallback option mm. because I kind of always kept post close to me yeah. and then eventually just merged, uh, blended the two, you know, DP and post together and then mm. went the post route and the, the DP sort of fizzled out after a couple of years. Um, but that, that was a conscious decision and luckily I had a, I had post to um, fall back on and, and post was always my original yeah. passion, but you know, being on set is, is a real rush and, mm. and I definitely, I'm happy I tried that. Yeah, I, I find the same years. thing, um, even just I was on set, my previous placement to this was on a set of Glamorous and a Netflix show. Oh yeah, okay. So I got to see the entire like big production scale with the set that's built just for the for shooting. And, um, it's, it's crazy how much, how much work goes into that. And I worked in commercials before, so I've seen kind of, you know, um, but yeah, shooting a series and being there every day at 7 a.m., 6 a.m. sometimes, it's it's tasking and it's draining. Um, yeah, and you don't always know when you're gonna be done yeah. either, so committing with friends sometimes was uh, a little complicated. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. you could say 7 p.m. and then you never it's know. another five you hours, uh, if weather's not cooperating or yeah. the director just needs to shoot so many takes, then, um, you know that that's that's hard on on friendships as, yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, it is. You also get to pick your own 
um, workload mm. as well. So if you commit yourself to a project, you know, you know that that's going to be two months of your life. Yeah. But you can also take two months off then, mm. right? And, and, and focus on whatever else you might be motivated to do or, yeah. or concentrate on or family things. Um, so there is that flexibility too. Mm. When you've got the nine to five, it's Monday through Friday, you know, nine to yeah. five and, and you get your vacation and... time, your two, two to three weeks, whatever it might be. Yeah. And um, then that's it. And for a lot of people, that's not the way they want to yeah. run their lives either. So um, the you know uh, difference between shooting and post is vast, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's it's two different types of people and yeah. lifestyles, yeah. Right. for sure. So, yeah. But I have seen many production people move into post. I think it can mm -hmm. be done. Um, and I've seen many um, post poop people move into um, production mm. as well. And, and often that's the natural um, progression is that people in editorial will yeah. often become directors. Mm. Um, they know what they need to shoot yeah. to make a story because of their editorial um, background. Yeah. And they can quickly move into directing mm. um, from, from that position. Quite interesting. I've seen that a lot in my career, and like, like at a high level too. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I don't know if you expected to be No, I did not. <laughs>